I'm proud to say that one of the first sponsors I have for this podcast is Rhythmia Life Advancement Centre. Rhythmia is a unique and special place to me. It's a healing resort fused with ayahuasca, uh, meditation, breathwork, yoga and lots of other metaphysical teachings. And they really um, sent me on a journey of healing and self-discovery that ultimately led to the creation of this podcast. So I really do owe Rhythmia a lot. And if you would like to go there and have a healing journey of your own, please visit them on their website at rhythmia.link forward slash can, spelled K-H-A-N, or give them a call on 877-835-1806 and receive a free shuttle worth $300 off your trip. Educate, inspire, change. Educate yourself, inspire others, change the world. Hello, welcome to my podcast. Today I'm going to be interviewing a very interesting man by the name of Rob Greenfield. He is an activist and humanitarian dedicated to leading the way to a more sustainable and just world. He embarks on extreme projects to bring attention to important global issues and inspire positive change. His work has been covered by media worldwide, including National Geographic, and he's been named the Robin Hood of Modern Times by France 2 TV. Rob's life is an embodiment of Gandhi's philosophy, be the change you wish to see in the world. He believes that our actions really do matter and that as individuals and communities, we have the power to improve the world around us. Rob donates 100% of his media income to grassroots nonprofits and has committed to living simply and responsibly for life. Thank you for joining me, Rob. It's good to be on here with the cash. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you too, man. I've been looking forward to this conversation for a while. Um, I think there's probably been a, you know, a lot going on in the last couple of months, as you know. So I think your message of living sustainably um, uh, is one that's probably never been as relevant as what it is today, you know? There's definitely a lot of people right now who are waking up to uh, some of the realities that exist in the world. And I've seen a, a lot of new people that are really wanting to change their life right now. Yeah. Yeah, big time. There's definitely been a lot of contemplation, a lot of people analyzing their priorities and, um, you know, taking a look at their life. So this pandemic, um, although it's been a a horrible thing to happen, it's also been a really, really big wake up call, I think. And people around the world are are starting to question the systems around us. They're starting to question their their life, their priorities. They're starting to prioritize their health and their well-being. And um, they're spending more time with family, spending time as a community. So like, this is a really, really interesting time. And I think your message has never been more relevant as what it is today, you know? So I'd, l- I'd love to know a little bit more about your background. Rob, where did you, what did you used to do before you went down this path? And what was it that triggered you down this road, you know? Sure. Yeah, well, uh, 2011 is when I woke up to, you know, many of the realities that are that are the world, um, I was living a sort of blind life. I was fairly consumeristic and sort of living the American dream. I wanted to have a nice house and a nice car and, you know, all the money I needed, just focused mostly on myself. Um, and what happened was I started to watch documentaries and read a lot of books. And that's when I realized I had to change my life. Prior to that, um, I went to school for biology at university. And the reason I was going to school for biology is because I always did have a passion for the earth and a passion for the outdoors and for nature. But the thing is, in, in school, they I feel like they didn't really teach us that we are nature, that we are a part of all of that. I feel like I kind of learned, I kind of was brought up to believe that we're sort of separate from it all. And once I realized there is no separate, that it's all connected, that's when I started to realize, oh, all of the actions that I'm taking are causing destruction to the very things that I, am, that I love and that I'm passionate about. And that's really what changed the course of, of the way that I was designing my life. Fascinating. So like, um, can, can you remember the, the moment when you decided to change the course of your life? Can you remember, was there a specific day or time where you said, that's it, I'm leaving my job, I'm going to start living better? 
No, it was definitely a transition state. It was mm. it was 2011 that I really started to wake up, and I remember mm -hmm. there were many different. There, every day I woke up a little bit more and a little bit more. Um, for example, one one doc was a a shake up for me was watching Zeitgeist, for example, mm. and then Food Inc was one that really taught me about the truth behind our current global industrial food system. And Earthlings taught me about the factory farmed animal system and reading books like The Omnivore's Dilemma by Michael Pollan. So it was just getting more and more and more information and putting it all together and starting to understand the bigger picture. And it was really a period of, of um, months that really came together. But the truth is, is that it was longer than that because there were many little things and and wake the wake up calls and realizations in the years prior to that but it was 2011 that i really started to dive deep and just pull back mm -hmm. the you know the the curtain behind my life and the 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 average american way of living that i was a part of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so uh when you say you've committed to living sustainably and responsibly what exactly does that mean well, for me, it means many things, but one of the things is living an examined lifestyle, uh, examined mm -hmm. life. And so what that means is it means understanding all of my actions and how they affect the earth, other people, other species, and the ecosystems that we depend upon. So it means looking at everything, the food I'm eating, the vehicles that I'm transporting myself in, the water that I'm using, the electricity that I'm using, the things that I purchase, where it comes from, how it gets to me, what's the impact that it has in that process. Mm -hmm. So it means examining all the facets of my life. And, and when I learn that there's injustice, inequality, and destruction that is being imparted upon the world through those actions, it means trying to change those. But it also means acknowledging that it's not possible to remain a part of society, change and be perfect. So when I say that my, you know, I've committed to living responsibly, that doesn't mean that I am able to do a perfect job of that. But where I'm not able to do a, where I'm not, not is being transparent about the reality behind my life and admitting the ways that I'm not able actions be in alignment with my beliefs but always be striving to do better mm -hmm. and so i read somewhere rob that you um are living with only 50 possessions is that still the case that's correct yeah so earlier this year in about january i got my life down to 44 possessions which is the least possessions that i've had. and i was in Costa Rica at the time, warm, a very warm climate. And I'm in mm -hmm. France now. And so I've accumulated a few possessions, a pair of pants, another sweater. R right now I have about 50 possessions. That's amazing. So like, um, and you just carry all your possessions in a bag or do you have like, uh, how does this work? Yeah, it's, uh, it's all in a, just a simple day pack. And the idea this is, you know, we live in a time where there's this idea that as long as you are able to buy what you need, that you're independent. Uh, mm -hmm. We're taught that we're kind of taught by mainstream society in order to be really a contributing member of society and a successful person, you have to be able to to basically buy to pay for everything that you need, and if you do that, that means you're independent. And I think that this is a, a fallacy. I think the truth is that money creates this illusion of independence. Being able to buy whatever goods or services we need, we're able to forget that behind that we spend, there's people, there's other species, and there's ecosystems. So myself living with 50 possessions, the idea of it is that I am trying to do something extreme that's designed to really get people to think about these very basic things that have been so overlooked in our current consumeristic way of life. And the idea is not for everybody 
to own just 50 possessions. I'd take things to the extreme because I'm trying to create deep thought uh, in the things that we often don't think about at all. Mm. Interesting. Um, I find your story particularly inspiring because you're you're a living embodiment of your message. You know, you you really are being the change that you wish to see in the world, and I find that very admirable. You know, a, a lot of people um, talk the talk, but they maybe don't necessarily walk the walk. You know, and I, and I have to put my hands up and admit I'm probably one of those. You know, I obviously run Educate Inspire Change, a platform. I'm always sharing information and knowledge and interviews about people who are talking about living sustainably or, you know, uh, um, healing the environment, healing themselves, but I, I, I too drive a car that has diesel, you know. I live in a house where there's lots of appliances, electricity, water, gas, heating. So, um, I, I, I admire people like you who, who live their own truth and who feel so passionately and strong about what they're doing that they live it themselves, you know. So, um, I find people like you an inspiration. So I just wanted to, to tell you that. And I'm really happy to have you on the platform today because what, one of the decisions I've made in the last few months is to uh, move my country of uh, residency. So I'm planning on moving to Costa Rica and the ultimate aim behind that is just to be more connected to nature and, you know, less part of the rat race, if you like, and just to be, to raise my children in a country where they value nature more, where they value the environment more, where there's no army, where there's less pollution, all these kind of factors are the kind of environment where I want to live and raise my children, you know? So like, uh, I'm hoping to maybe be close to where you are in a couple of years time, living more sustainably um looking after uh, my environment a lot more better, you know? So um, I think uh, a lot of people could use you as an example. You, you've been to Costa Rica before yourself, haven't you? Yes, and I do consider it to be one of the most amazing places to live and just be able to live a simple, sustainable life. It is it's definitely a place yeah. to relocate to to really facilitate that. Yeah, yeah. One of the biggest attractions to me for Costa Rica is nature and how much they look after their nature, you know? How, how important a role does nature play in your life and how much time do you spend in nature? Well, it's an complete, uh, com completely important role. I mean, we wouldn't exist without it. It gives us everything mm -hmm. that we need and, and any idea that it doesn't is just just a, because of a complete disconnection with the reality uh, of the world that we live in. So it plays a role in my life with everything that I do. But as a direct connection, I try to be very directly connected to it. It is to do so because I do spend way more time in cities than I would like. And I spend more time on computers than I would like, for example, doing this podcast, um, as far as my personal health. But it's a balance because what I'm trying to do is really affect change. And I found that my best way of, like, I found that the computer is a tool that allows me to do that. And I found being in places with large populations of people is where I'm able to be most effective. So mm -hmm. I'm, I spend a lot of time just, you know, out in the woods or in the lakes and, um, even if I'm living in a city, I still manage to be pretty connected by finding the patches of nature that are still intact. Um, so I would say that I'm, even the fact that I'm far less connected than I would like to, a lot of people look at my life and see how deeply connected I am to nature compared to how, you know, disconnected mm -hmm. most people are today. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's funny because someone said to me um, while I was in Costa Rica on my last visit, they were talking to me about the imbalance of energy on the planet. And they were saying that humans have lost touch with nature. Uh, and there's a number of physical reasons for this, just by the invention of like a rubber soles, for example. So humans are all walking around with rubber, you know, like an inch of rubber between them and the planet, you know. So people are no longer feeling connected to the earth. And also women, uh, since, they, since the invention of sanitary products, this person said to me that women are no longer in, in, in connection with the earth because they used to bleed onto the land, you know, whereas mm. now... They're, they're, you know, they're flushing things to the toilet and it's plastic going everywhere. And this is why that there's been an imbalance in energy on the planet. That masculine energy seems to have taken over from the feminine energy. And they used an analogy of this is why there's so much male bloodshed on the planet. 
through wars and all this kind of thing, you know, and that slowly we're starting to see the rise of this feminine energy. Do you have anything to comment about this? Do you, do you see this shift in energy in the planet? And uh, what, what's your take on that? Well, there's no question that we have disconnected ourselves from the source of life in so many ways. Those would be examples mm -hmm. of some. Another example would be sidewalks and I mean, it's a complete disconnection from the earth by making everything flat. And mm -hmm. um, the removal of nature from our daily lives, the pollution of our air, the pollution of our water, um, our, our climate-controlled scenarios where we can just be inside, go from the car, for the house to the car, to the office or school. We have designed our lives today to largely disconnect ourselves from the the earth and the challenges that it provides but those challenges are what keeps us connected and a, to me a life that has been made very easy and convenient is generally a life that is disconnected from those things that give us life. and so in some ways they've made our life easier but then you see a lot of the ways that humans and humanity are are suffering greatly mm. but we are many of us are so far removed from the source that we just don't see how we're suffering and many of us don't know another way because we were born into this way of life and have never really been connected to 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 really have a major difference to compare it to mm. uh, while you're talking i'm conscious of something that's came into my mind lately. Uh, during this pandemic, I'm hearing a lot of people talk about the problems that society faces, the problems with this virus, the problems of how we're living, but I'm not hearing very many people talking about solutions, you know? And this is something that I'm trying to consciously remember when I'm having these conversations, because often you can get dogged down and talking about all these issues that humanity is facing, all the problems that we as humans are facing, and we can forget that maybe yes. uh, we should focus our energy on the solutions rather than focusing so much energy on what's wrong. So my question to you is, is basically um, with everything that we've said in mind, with everything that we've said kept in mind, we have an awareness of what's wrong with the world. But how do you think uh, we as humans, as a race, can affect this change? Like you, for example, are an extreme version. You're, you're a living embodiment of being the change. But for somebody who can't or, or is it in a position to just pack up their bags and live sustainably or or to go to the countryside? Maybe they have kids, maybe they have a mortgage, they have pay bills to pay, they have business to run or people are, you know, rely on them. For your average person, what can they start doing in their life today or even now while they're listening to this to start to be the change that they want to see in the world? Yeah, absolutely. And, and the truth is, is that 95% of the time I focus on and I talk about solutions. Um, mm -hmm. I, I talk about the pro problems only as, as is needed to create the thought, but then it's all about solutions. So, mm -hmm. and then also I, I provide an extreme example of a way of life, but the truth is that most of the things that I do are something that just about everybody can do. So the things that you know, some of the things that I consider the most life changing changes that people can make that have a shift that can create a shift throughout their entire life. Um, one would be growing some of your own food. If you're in the city, maybe you can grow some of your own food on just a balcony or even a windowsill. You can grow some of your herbs or you can join a community garden. If you're in, uh, you know, a suburb, you can maybe turn your whole herd into a garden or a food forest. If you're in the countryside, you know, maybe you can have a whole big farm. It's all about looking at the scenario that you're in, instead of looking at someone else and saying, oh, I can't do that. Look at them and say, what inspiration take from them into the situation that I have? So uh, continuing on with food, some other big things that I always recommend to people are supporting local uh, farmers and growers. So sourcing as much of your food locally as you can. And if you can't grow your own food, this is a perfect thing that you can do is support people who do grow food locally. Another thing is buying less processed foods. Processed foods are foods that corporations have really been able to alter. And often this is where you get a lot of GMOs and ingredients that are just really toxic for you and for the environment. 
So more whole foods that are one simple ingredient and then cooking from scratch and connecting to that food um, and then less packaged food. So food that's not, you know, wrapped in plastic, for example. So those are some of my big suggestions for getting for things that people can start with. Um, and I really always recommend for a lot of people starting with food because it's one of our biggest gateways to connecting with earth. It's one of the most important things for personal health. And it's a great way to get involved with our local communities. And by doing this, shifting this one area of your life, I've seen often that it can create a ripple effect that can start to ripple out through your entire life and, and everything that you do. Mm, awesome. Great advice. And I'm also curious to know, um, how do you see mindfulness fitting into all this? Do, do you uh, practice mindfulness yourself? Yeah, I mean, I see that there's a big, there's often a big separation between sustainability and mindfulness. There's often the yoga world, and you go into it and you realize that there's, in many scenarios, there's almost no paying attention to sustainability. Um, or if there is, it's like a lot of greenwashed sustainability. Um, and you often see a big separation between mindfulness and sustainability or, you know, caring about our earth. But the two things ultimately are inseparable. For me, they go completely hand in hand. Mindfulness means paying attention to your actions and how they affect the world. Now, for example, you can go vegan and consider yourself mindful, but if you and, and think that you're doing something good for the earth, but if you don't really know the source of your food and it turns out, okay, you're not eating animals, but the, the plant-based foods that you're eating are still calling, ca causing injustice and, equal, and inequality in the world, then that's not really mindful eating and mindful living. So for me, it's all about mindfulness is at the center of everything because mindfulness is a very basic thing. It's understanding our actions, simply being mindful of our actions. And then when we are mindful and we learn that something isn't what we thought it was, that's what allows us to be able to change it. So I see the two things as something that should be inseparable, but often they are very separated. Mm, yeah. That's a very interesting point. Thank you for making that. Um, it's very thought provoking, isn't it? Because um, there's a lot of people, there's a wave of, um, uh, there's almost like a big trend where everyone's doing yoga, everyone's practicing meditation, everyone's preaching about all this becoming spiritual. But uh, I think I have to agree with you when, when I say that most of those people probably aren't very mindful with how they live and how they're taking care of the planet or the environment. So it's an interesting point that you make there, definitely. Um, so tell me, what are you doing these days? What, what, what are you doing with yourself? Like, describe to me a, a life in the day of uh, Rob Greenfield, you know? Like, you, you live sustainably, you're living, uh, you're helping to heal the environment, but how do you make a living? Uh, are you, do you talk to people? How are you spreading your message of truth? Sure. Well, right now is a bit of a tricky time with, with lockdown. I'm in France, and I've been here since lockdown began. And so my contact with actual humans is very, very minimal. Um, I'm also in mostly the countryside where a lot of people don't speak English. So as far as <laughs> connecting with people in person, it's not something that I'm really able to do, which is ironic because this year I was on a World Solutions Tour where I was going to be giving about 70 to 100 talks in about 20 or 30 different countries around the world about, you know, and it was called the World Solutions Tour. So it was all about what people could do wherever they are to be the change that they wish to see. Um, so right now, a lot of my work is online with whether it's writing or videos or you know media, podcasts and such. Um, and so a lot of my time and energy goes into that through you know finding ways to educate people and to inspire people through mm -hmm. things that I can make online. Um, and then on a personal level, of course, my goal is always to lead by example. Um, so right now I'm actually staying at a community that is a permaculture farm. And so every day I'm out in the garden a little bit uh, at least. And we actually just built a tiny house this week out of wood, all wood from on the site, which was a new experience for me. 
Um, we actually did the whole process from milling the trees all the way to building the house out of them, which was pretty, pretty beautiful. Um, but yes, so for me, the, the key is just always continuing to follow through on all of the aspects of sustainable living because it's something you have to maintain. Once you make those changes, you have to keep them up. And then it's about uh, educating people and you know continuing to do that and as far as money goes i think you asked about like you know how's that mm -hmm. work my financial situation so i've i've committed to donating 100 percent of my media income to nonprofits. so from tv shows and books and things like that and i've done that since about 2015. the bit of money that i do need personally i earn from public speaking um and I earn less than $10,000 a year. So most of the money I have donated to nonprofits because I've designed my life to need very little money um, by, by being connected to the resources that the earth freely and abundantly creates for us. I need a lot less money than, than the average person. And I've designed my life to be largely outside of the monetary system, which took many years, many years of unraveling my life because it was wrapped up in the monetary system. Um, so yeah. Mm. Have you encountered any friction from family and friends? Like when you made this shift and change into the way you live and your life, did you encounter any pushback? S certainly, yes. Overall, I have to say not nearly as much as other people deal with. I know that a lot of people have to deal with families who are very stuck in doing things one certain way or are very judgmental. I'm very mm. grateful to be from a family where we're very open-minded to different ways of living and where we just accept people largely for who they are. That's kind of a common theme that runs across um, my mom's side of the family, I'm not very involved with the dad's side of my family. Um, so that, that I can say about the green fields. And, mm -hmm. um, but I have, did certainly have some pushback. Um, my dad was not supportive when I decided to really focus on, on this. And, but for me, I don't let that play too large of a role in my life because for me it's far more important to live the life that i feel purposeful and passionate about than to please any family member or friend mm -hmm. and there's seven billion people on earth there's or eight billion people on earth there's plenty of people to be friends and family with i don't have to <laughs> hold on to any one person you know i don't live a life of attachment mm -hmm. so if somebody isn't fine with the way that i'm doing things that's fine. We mm -hmm. don't need to be friends if it's if if you don't really want to be friends with me and we don't even we don't need to be family just because we happen to be born into the same just because you gave mm -hmm. birth to me doesn't mean I owe you um mm -hmm. you know my entire life. So certainly some pushback, but I also have to say that I've generally just been someone who's always been pretty passionate about pursuing life and not not living life because someone else wants me to do things a certain way. Yeah. Whilst in Costa Rica last year, um, I came across a guy by the name of Anthony Walsh who handed me a bottle of hemp extract CBD oil. And after just taking a few drops, I was sold. I immediately felt more relaxed, less stressed. I found the quality of my sleep improved and it even helped me with my meditation practices. The reason this product stands out for me was Anthony himself is passionate about healing the world one person at a time and has personally invested thousands of hours researching CBD and cannabinoids in order to fully understand how to help guide others to receive the maximum benefits of taking hemp oil extracts. His company is called Eco Life Supplements and I highly recommend it to anyone that wants to have a better, happier and healthier life. It's 100% natural, organically grown, all natural and non-GMO guaranteed for your best experience. To order yours now, please visit ecolifesupplements.com and quote coupon code INSPIRECHANGE for a 10% discount and they are currently only delivering in the US. 
that's a, uh, an important point you make there because I think so many people are, are living based on the opinions and thoughts of other people, you know? Like they, they'll drive cars or they'll wear certain clothes or they'll eat in certain restaurants, not because they may, maybe like that car or those clothes, but because they, they like the feeling that they get when other people look at them, you know? It's very like a, it's a big problem that I think society faces in a whole here. And um, I discussed this in one of my videos I made on Educate Inspire Change a while back about why I think the world is full of brainwashed people. Just because when we are born, we're given names, we're given labels, titles, religions, belief systems, and we're told this is you, this is what you are, you know? And, um, and also all our life, we'll, we're raised with all these walls around us. And it feels like what you've done is you're one of the few people that's kind of taken a step back, looked at these walls and broken them down and made your own path in life, you know? Which is very admirable because not many people do that. Uh, I mean, I think even even the most ardent of people who who claims to be environmentally friendly or aware or mindful, they are still living within these walls, you know? It's something that I'm working on on a personal level. And what, one of the things that's really brought this to my attention in the last year has been uh, the use of psychedelics and plant medicine. It's really shattered the walls I had around me, you know? It's really made me question the way I live, uh, made me much more mindful. It's made me look at my relationships not just with other people, but with myself as well, you know, like uh, how comfortable, how well do I sleep at night based on the way I live during the day, you know? So like, what kind of lies am I telling myself to keep myself comfortable, you know? So um, I, I find your story all the more inspirational because I'm starting on this path of living sustainably, becoming much more mindful with the way I live, with practicing what I preach, you know? So um I'm interested to know if you ever had any experience with psychedelics and if so, have they played a part in the way you've changed your views in the world? I haven't really, uh, I haven't used psychedelics myself and mm. I respect them greatly. And that's one mm. of the reasons that I haven't used them because I do respect them so much that if I do use <laughs> them, I want it. It's not a social mm. thing. It's, it's a, it's a, medicine it's a tool for um you know expansion not something to party with and so that's one mm -hmm. reason that i actually haven't yet the other thing is that i i myself am in the public eye of children and in most places these uh beautiful plants are illegal because of governments mm. And I want to be able to talk to them and say, you don't need these things in order to expand your mind and expand your consciousness. They are amazing tools, but it can be done without them. Um, so that's one of the big things that has prevented me from, uh, from expand, you know, having them as tools mm -hmm. in my life to expand my mind. Um, however, really in the last six months or so, I've really started to feel called and that it is time and, uh, that I, that they would be of great, uh, benefit to me and to what I'm mm -hmm. trying to do. And mm -hmm. so I would say that it is likely in, in, the, in the near future that, um, that I will embark on that path somewhat. Interesting. Yeah, that's uh, great to hear because like like you, I hadn't touched psychedelics for the first 36 years of my life, you know, like I, I was uh, wary of them, I was scared of them, and I didn't really understand the medicine or the healing aspect to them until the last couple of years when I started researching and reading books and watching documentaries and understanding the realms of ayahuasca and DMT and all this kind of stuff. And I was fortunate to have been invited by uh, Rhythmia Life Advancement Center to go and try ayahuasca. And that was in March of 2019, you know, and, and since then, like, uh, it's been crazy the journey I've been on in that year, you know, I've probably um, done more spiritual and personal growth in one year because of plant medicine than I did in the previous 10 years, you know. So I, I appreciate what you're saying, like, everyone, everyone has the ability within them to do make these changes without any other tools. But for somebody like me, I really needed that kick up the backside, you yeah. know, that wake up call, you know, some people do. And and there are certain things that this medicine touches and affects that are like, for example, I, I, I believe and I feel that a lot of humans carry in their DNA, family trauma or family karma, or, you know, like whether if someone's father, for example, abused them, or if someone's father was an alcoholic or a gambler, uh, this can often be passed down, you know, and sometimes this, this, 
they need a form of medicine to come and uh, really help them to overcome these obstacles in life, you know, to break the cycle of pain, their cycle of abuse. And that's one of the great uh, benefits I've seen of this medicine, because when I go to Rhythmia or any other plant medicine retreat, all the people there have a story and they all uh, seem to have a, a pattern of abuse or trauma suffered during childhood, you know, and this is what's mm. caused them to have uh, substance abuse or depression or anxiety, which has, you know, uh, affected their life in a negative way and forced them onto this path of plants. But for somebody like you, uh, who's who I see as being somewhat of a pioneer, someone who has a strong message of truth, I see the plants uh, almost being able to work through you. Like, for example, I run the Educate Inspire Change platform, yeah? And one of my, when I done plant medicine during a ceremony, one of my uh, intentions was I wanted to really discover my purpose and to find out why I'm here on the planet, you know? And it was... Um, very clear to me that night that the plants were telling me to use my voice to start to share my message of truth, to start to uh, live my own truth, which is one of the reasons why I'm moving country, why I want to live more sustainably, why I want to be more mindful, why I want to even do this podcast to talk to people like you so I can start spreading these messages of truth with the world, you know? And I think uh, I'm really happy to hear that you're called to the medicine because I think when you start your journey, I think it will be very, very profound for you. And I think it will do nothing but amplify your message and amplify your conviction and give you more clarity and more guidance and more support on the path that you're on, you know. And just while we're on this podcast, I want you to know that if you ever do feel called and if you're looking for someone to help facilitate that, you you have you can come through me and I'll be more than happy to arrange like a, a, a an ayahuasca ceremony for you. It'd be my pleasure. Wow. Uh, well, I will keep that in mind then because that would be, that would be wonderful. And, and again, I just have the utmost respect and support for this. I've seen so many lives changed when used for the right intentions and purposes. I can't tell you how many people's mm. lives around me have changed for the better. Um, mm. I've, I, you know, they can be difficult journeys, but they are almost always positively difficult journeys. Yeah, 100%. And I think you hit the nail on the head when you said intention is everything, you know. As long as you're doing the medicine for the correct reasons and, you know, your, your intentions are, are pure, then you'll have a great time, you know. Uh, I, I think that's the biggest thing is that you have to feel called. So, like, if somebody doesn't feel called, they have to just wait until they feel ready because they need to really want to do it for the right reasons, you know. Not to do it to yeah. just to explore the other realm or just to have some fun or to trip. That's definitely not not what these medicines are for, you know, but I'm excited yeah. to hear more about your journey when you do decide to, to embark on it. And I hope that maybe I can be part of it as well. Yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> yeah. So like, um, what, what's your plans for the future, um, Rob? Like, uh, obviously this, we're in the middle of this pandemic just now, so the future is quite uncertain, but like uh, uh, they, they say they're hoping in the, in the next few months that we should hopefully start to reopen borders Um start to be able to travel again more freely. Where, where, where do you see yourself? Like, are you planning on doing more talks? Are you planning on doing more, you know, you, you mentioned this this um, uh, talk you were meant to be on 20, 30 countries doing 70 to 100 talks. Are you going to try to do something similar again? And if so, do you have any plans? Well, uh, basically this, this whole thing really reinvigorated my desire to get back to the land. Um, being sort of stuck country where it, it's it's ironic timing because just before this happened i had just finished a year-long project of growing and foraging 100 percent of my food so i was living off the land no grocery stores no restaurants like i had gardens throughout my neighborhood i knew where all the food was in my region and it would have been the perfect time to be doing that if the mm. pandemic happened now. Ironically, I'm on this tour where I'm actually dependent upon the grocery stores and then it all comes crashing down. And I found myself to be quickly a little tired by the traveling, the public transportation, trains and buses. And, and, and so basically my plan was to do this tour for for a year and a half but i've quickly been re-inspired to get back to the land sooner and to have a base where i'm really connected to the land and land-based so i intend to 
to do that later this summer or fall. And in the long run, my intentions is to either start a community or join a community where I can really be of service and work together and have that as a land base where people can come and learn these basic skills and stay for days or weeks or possibly months to really get back to the basics and, and change their lives. And so my plan is to is probably, I'm thinking as of now, to settle in the upstate New York area. And that will be my base for the next few years. I'm going to do another year of growing and foraging 100% of my food, this time in a cold climate, because so many people want to see how to do that. And then this will be sort of my, uh, I'm planning on sort of creating the experiment uh, for two years of what I'm maybe going to design for the long term game plan of this sort of simple living institute or you know place for people to come and learn so that's basically my my short term slash long term and then in the long term my plan is to to create this place be be a part of this place and then maybe half the year or three quarters of the year i can be there and then half or th or a quarter of the year i will be out doing speaking or activism campaigns and such but always have that base where I'm really truly living out my my belief system to the to the strongest ability. Mm. Awesome. That that really resonates with me because in the last year, traveling to and from Costa Rica, meeting people who are on this plant medicine journey, who are um kind of wanting to live sustainably and whatnot, I've came across a lot a lot of like-minded people, you know? And um a lot of these people are the same mindset as me and you. They want to live sustainably. They want to build their own community. They want to have somewhere where they can just live off the land, live free, have less stress, no bills to pay, leave their doors unlocked, and we can enjoy, you know, the pleasure of each other's company, really to create their own tribe and their own vibe and their own, you know, their own family. So this has been um, something that where I, I've been envisioning for myself in the future. And I, I, I've came across so many people who want to do the same thing. And they're, it's exciting to think what the future might hold, you know, especially with me moving to Costa Rica soon. I'm, I'm really I'm thinking that's a perfect place to build a sustainable community. There's already lots of people doing similar things there. Um, so that's definitely something that's in my mind as well, you know. So I think the more people like me and you, if we can just work together, try to stay organized, try to, you know, just stay in communication and, and like uh, have this goal in our mind, I think it will be a reality very, very soon for all of us, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And for people that are interested in living in community, um, the website, ic.org for intentionalcommunities.org is a great place to start. There's thousands of communities out there that you can either visit or um, live in. And I think living in community connected to the land is, is, is the, it's the solution for our time. I mean, imagine in a lockdown where you're locked down with all the people, with many of the people that you love, that you want to be with, and where you have all the food that you need coming from your land and where you're connected to nature, where you can go out into the woods and be connected to it, living in community can, can design your life where you have your basic needs met, love and you know connection, those sorts of humanly needs, but also the basic needs of food and water and such. Um, and I think, I think living in community is definitely one of the big solutions to the, to the problems that we deal with today. Yeah, I would agree with you there. Um, I keep going back to plant medicine just because it's been such a big part of my journey, but there's been a lot of people who have been doing plant medicine who have been saying the same thing. They've been uh, in communication with the spirit of the plant, ayahuasca in this case, and uh, all of them are saying they're being told to get away from the cities, to leave these mm. places where there's dense, high population and to go back into nature and to start to build their own communities. This is the message that we're, they're getting from the plants, you know, and they're saying it will get much worse before it gets better. Like these cities are going to, there's going to be more crime, more prostitution, you know, more like um, we, we, all these, all this talk of, um, you know, people being chipped and people, um, you know, like Big Brother uh, is watching everyone and we really need to get away from this authoritarian kind of um, uh, life that we're being forced into almost, you know. And, and I think um, humans aren't designed to live in cities. We never were, you know, like um, we're not meant to live in a city with a million people stacked in buildings that go all the way 
to the to the you know into the sky. It's just it's just a breeding ground for crime, for disease, for mental illness, all this stuff, you know. And then to top it all off, alcohol and drugs play such a big part of these cities and of, of this kind of life, you know. Like when I live in Scotland, for example, drinking is just a part of culture. Practice. We're raised myself as children to think and I've drinking is. That. Uh, social activity that should should happen every weekend, you know. Our parents drink every weekend. Our families and friends drink all the time at events, at dinner. It's just a part of life and culture, you know. And um, it's something that's been embedded into us. And it, it takes it took me lots of years to try to get out of that culture of drinking and uh, this, that that is normal. That is almost un. It's almost like um, if you don't drink, you're not a man, you know. So I think um, mm. on that, I think like have you heard of somebody called Jordan Peterson? He's a he's a doctor. A psychologist? Yes, I've definitely heard the name many, many times and probably seen some of his work, but I don't remember it exactly right now. Yeah. So he, he's someone who I've been following a lot of his talks and his lectures, and there's so many of them online. I do recommend it. But like, uh, he's quite divisive because he talks straight to the, to the point, and a, a lot of people find him quite controversial. But I think he's quite right in saying that the way society has been set up is wrong. You know, there's a there's a strong imbalance and, and men don't talk enough about their emotions, about their feelings. And we all, you know, this is a big, a big problem in society today, you know, like, um, so this is another thing I want to just briefly talk to you about is mental health. And um, because uh, so many people just now are suffering from mental illness, whether it's anxiety, depression, substance abuse. Uh, and I'd like to get your take on this. And obviously diet can have a big impact on that as well. So it's in alignment with your belief that we should change our diet, we should eat natural. But like, uh, have you ever suffered from mental issues yourself? Or do you know anyone that has? And what would be, would be your advice on this topic? Yeah, today it's maybe more common than uncommon to to have mental health issues uh, in the world that we live in today. It's uh, it's a miracle mm -hmm. almost to not have have <laughs> uh, you know at least life is a struggle. There's no question about that. Yes, um, I definitely. So of course I'm connected to a lot of people who who have these challenges, uh, including in my family and my friends. I myself have been very uh i would say partly lucky just genetically to to not have any real mental health issues and have a pretty uh you know flow there but at the same time i also don't think it's just luck i have put an incredible amount of practice into keeping myself mentally healthy and i've been doing that uh, i started to do that at a at a fairly young age um so for me some of my biggest tips as far as keeping and uh, reducing the possibility of some mental health issues, you know, one of the big ones is reducing drinking of alcohol. That one is a really big one because for people who do have mental health issues, the alcohol often compounds it and makes it worse and often puts you in situations where you end up making poor decisions, which make life worse, which makes the issues that you're dealing with worse. So a big one for me was giving up drinking alcohol. And I I used to drink very heavily as just a, a binge drinker. I wasn't an alcoholic, but you wouldn't have known that by looking at me. I mean, I blacked out a lot and, you know, I had drinking problems for sure. Um, typical American, uh, you know, young binge drinking type of situation. But so that's. My life drastically uh, not drinking alcohol another one is food you know a lot of the food that we put into our bodies isn't real food it's a lot of chemical uh, chemically derived substances made in alcohol that are not designed for us and can have a huge impact on our hormones um, and estrogen levels for example um, so eating food that is real food whole foods from the land is something that I really recommend for uh, maintaining a, a high level of mental health. Um, and then some, you know, just basic things, making sure to breathe deep, uh, drinking clean water, uh, moving the body. That doesn't mean like necessarily like rigorous exercise, like running really fast or something like that. Just simply biking, walking, gardening just making sure your body is moving. Um, 
plenty of time outside in fresh air. You know, the sun is a natural disinfectant for the body, for bacteria. It's also, for me, a natural way to clear the mind. So I think all of these basic things that we've been removed from are basic things that help keep us centered and balanced. And so for me, these are all things that I try to keep as a, as a balance in my life that to some people are you know, very challenging, but to me just comes fairly natural now once I woke up, you know, 2010, I, I wasn't doing a lot of this stuff, but now it comes fairly natural. Um, and then another one, you know, I mentioned alcohol, which is a drug. Well, alcohol can be used really wisely and really well. You can make your own from quality uh, local source materials. But as far as drugs, you know, I don't consider marijuana or uh, ayahuasca or psilocybin mushrooms drugs. Um, they they can be used, they can be used positively or for your mental psyche. But generally, I consider those as as tools, as plants. But there are certainly some, you know, like things like cocaine, for example. Those for me, avoiding those are very important for for mental health. So there's many things, but those would be some of the really important ones to me. And another big one is truth. Living truthfully does an incredible amount for mental health because imagine if you're living a lie, every day you're sort of contradicting yourself and trying to you know, ex say things one way when it's not the reality and when you're not being who you really are and you're trying to be someone else, that creates an incredible amount of friction in your mind. So seeking truth and being the truth to me, is also an important part of a foundation towards positive mental health. Mm, uh, I 100% agree with everything you said, and I'm particularly glad that you mentioned the bit at the end where you spoke about living your truth, because this is probably that not uh, you don't hear it very often, do you? Like you, when people talk about mental health or um, you know uh, your your mindfulness, they don't really mention speaking truth and not lying, and that that includes not lying to yourself. You know, but often people can be in relationships they don't want to be in, but they're just maybe lying to them. They're maybe not being faithful or whatever it is they're doing, and they're living in constant turmoil, and they don't realize the effect this has on their long term mental health and even physical health as well. You know, because um, a stress of the mind results to stress it ends up being stress in the body as well you know like there's so many people i see um who are suffering from chronic illnesses chronic pains chronic fatigue and it, it all stems from um an imbalance imbalanced emotional state you know where they're unhappy with something in their life whether they're not being truthful to themselves whether they're in an unhappy marriage or whatever that might be so that's a very very important one and it, um again this is something again that i found this out in the last year that even me myself i i was living a lie but not i was lying to other people but i was lying to myself about who i was you know and this mm -hmm. is very important to me i find it, i find it very hard to lie even to myself now you know and and if it's even if it's a white lie to keep someone else happy i I still, I still find it hard. I need to be honest as I can be because the brutal truth yeah. is sometimes better than a comfortable lie, you know? Um, it's I almost agree. like a weight on my shoulders. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and that is another really important thing for mental health is right relationships too. I mean, I really believe in the saying, you are your surroundings. So surrounding yourself with what you want to be, I think is so important and surround with the people that bring you up and don't bring you down. And that's so important to remove yourself from toxic relationships and instead surround yourself with positive relationships. That's one of the you know, absolute biggest things is, you know, some people, it's very difficult, but you have to be able, you have, for a lot of us, you have to be able to break away from those toxic relationships. And for some people, that's easier than others. You know, I feel for people mm -hmm. that are really, really stuck relationships, but breaking free from those and finding, and finding. Finding like my was a really important thing for, for positive mental health as well. 
Yeah, I agree. And I think that, uh, again, the time that we're living in, that might never be more relevant than it is today because uh, I constantly am find myself thinking about people's situations at home, you know. Uh, if people are in a, a toxic relationship or they're living with people that are maybe abusive or whatnot, and at this time, they're all being forced indoors to be together 24-7, you know. So there must be a lot of friction, a lot of um, issues like this. And I think that's anyone who's in that situation is listening to this podcast. I think they can use a lot of the tools that you've mentioned Um uh, to try to help them create healthy boundaries, to try to help them to create a healthy lifestyle so they can make the best decisions for them, you know, because some people are stuck. Perhaps they have no money. Perhaps they're relying on their partner or spouse to provide for them. And perhaps they're in an abusive relationship and they can't leave, you know, or there might be kids involved. So there's a lot of really tough situations that people can be in where they find that they can't get out of, you know. So I think that the things that you mentioned, being in nature, eating healthy, being mindful about how you're living, practicing meditation, you know, being healthy and just like moving, all this kind of stuff can be useful tools to them to try to detach themselves from this situation, you know? So like, uh, I think it's def definitely an important message there, you know? Yeah. And I really feel for people right now who are stuck in, you know, you know abusive homes, it is a very difficult time because if you're not allowed to leave, then you it's kind of stuck in it. But there are a lot of things you can do to improve your life even when stuck in that scenario. But I want to mention one thing, and that is for people who are listening to this who are in difficult situations like that, when, f when they are able to move, one thing I would recommend is woofing, which is you can volunteer on organic farms and you don't need much money or money at all because when you're there, you work basically about 25 hours a week and you get your food and your lodging covered and you get to be outside and learning about growing your own food and you don't pay to be there at all. And this is, this is a really good way to escape and to surround yourself with positive people. And that's uh, woofing is Worldwide Opportunities on Organic Farm. If, if you look that up, um, that can be a really life-changing way. And it's accessible because it doesn't cost money and you can do it. You don't have to travel the world to do it. You can find opportunities right in your own country or right in your own county. There might be people doing it mm, that's very i've never heard of a thing so that's news to me we'll mm. definitely uh, leave a link to that or somewhere in the description when we're doing the show notes for this podcast that's very interesting cool. so like um uh i just, just want to uh, lastly before we tie things up i want to ask you about technology you, you mentioned earlier about um you're you're in a little bit of uh battle with using technology because you you realize its importance in spreading your message of truth, but you also don't want to spend too much time on the computer or, you know, using electricity, for example. So like um, uh, social media is a big part of my life because I obviously run the Educate Inspire Change platform. So I find myself using my laptop, using my phone almost every day, you know, as, as my business. And uh, I, have, I found that what's useful for me is being very careful with the pages and the people that I follow because I don't want my feed to be full of negative, uh, you know, I, I'm very mindful with what I'm consuming mm -hmm. is what I'm trying to say, you know? So I like to, even with Educate Inspire Change, I, I used to share uh, lots of information and news about events in the world that maybe weren't very positive, you know? So for example, I would raise awareness on, on unjust wars. I would raise awareness on poverty. I would raise awareness on racism. But what I found was what I was doing was I was sending out a very negative frequency to the planet. I was bringing the vibration down, you know? And so what I'm trying to do now more is focus on solutions, like we were mentioning earlier, to try to focus on information that can raise the vibration of the planet so that those negative problems, although they're, it's good to be aware of them, but I want them to go away. And the only way they can go away is by creating solutions, by creating new problems, you know? So like um, a, a lot of people have been reaching out to me in the last month about COVID-19, about this virus, and asking me about the conspiracies behind it. Why does it exist? Is it real? is it man-made all this kind of stuff and although it's very important to be aware of the realities i find it's much more useful to focus on what can we learn from this and what can we do to prevent it happening in the future and what can we do to grow from this you know so, so like focus on the solutions and one of the big parts of that to me is when you're on social media is to follow pages and people that you like that are adding value to your life. So I'm trying to avoid following conspiracy theory pages. I'm trying to avoid following people that are always spreading hate about Donald Trump or whoever it might be, you know. I'm focusing on people like yourself who are really focused on 
increasing the consciousness of the planet. So I, I just like to hear a little bit uh, from you about this, like because technology to me can be a very important and valuable tool. Because if it wasn't for technology, me and you wouldn't know each other. We wouldn't be connected. I, I wouldn't have three million followers on Facebook, and you probably wouldn't have been able to connect with people around the world the way you have as well, you know? So I, I just want to hear your take on technology. How can people use it and how can people use it mindfully? Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's definitely one of the things that I struggle with. And it's definitely one of the things that brings down my mental health the most of anything. It's my relationship with the computer. I, I, have, a, I have a very much a difficult relationship with it. Not so much the computer, it's the internet really. Um, if mm. And so it's something that I've been struggling with really since, uh, for, for sure, since 2013, so seven years. And it, you know, it wasn't as hard as in the past. It wasn't as hard in the past because the internet wasn't so all per pervasive, but now it's so integrated into our lives that it's, it's much more difficult. So I have a lot of practices that I do to have a good balance. Um, some of the basic things is I try to always shut off the, well, for, I actually got rid of my cell phone five years ago, so now I only have a computer. Um, but whether it's cell phone or computer, um, one of the things is shutting it off at least an hour before bed. So if you go to bed at 10 o'clock, shutting all those things off at 9 o'clock, and then waiting at least a half hour after waking up before turning it on so that you have time for your eyes to see the world and, you know, and wake up and be present in the moment. And so that's a very, you know, basic thing that's so many, so many of us have, have a hard time a doing it. I myself and still have a hard time doing it, but generally succeed. Um, what I recommend, the other thing is actually going offline completely one day a week. Sunday is an easy to do it, day to do it because so many other people are offline and work is, you know, less emails and such. But whatever day a week, if you can do one day a week offline, um, and then right now this year, my focus is I'm trying to do one week offline every month, which is new for me. And that's very challenging. I've done it. I did it in January and February, and I just did five days um, this, this month. Not a, I didn't succeed at the week, but that's very helpful. And I, I, uh, so those are some uh, basic tips. The thing that I recommend doing is when you go out, to put your cell phone in a drawer at home and you know experiment with going out into the world with no cell phone and just being present where you are. And if you're going to dinner with friends, put that cell phone on silent in your bag, backpack, or your purse. And when you're with your friends, just be with your friends. Put it away. If you go to my, if you go to robgreenfield.org/onlineaddiction, I've actually discussed my problems with the online world and how I, and then how I deal with it, and my tips for other people. And a big part of it is removing all the content that is toxic, and surrounding yourself with content that brings you up. So. For example, I go, I have a page, robgreenfield.org slash Facebook is Facebook pages that I recommend. robgreenfield.org slash YouTube is YouTube pages that I recommend. And then slash music is healthy music because I really recommend putting good, healthy music into your mind. Um, so absolutely with the online world, I try to try to use it as something that brings you up and not down. And on that page, I, I do list a lot of helpful tips that have been helpful for me. And uh, I've friends, talked to a lot of with and they friends. tell me that away. they'll, after um, talking to me about it, they'll turn off their computer and their cell phone for the first time in years for 24 hours. And they say it's the most refreshing thing they've done in so long. It's, it, it's a one 24 hour period offline can create such a reset for the mind and it's so beneficial for the mental health. Awesome. I think I'll maybe try that myself because it's been a big issue of mine is technology. You know, I'm constantly on my phone, I'm constantly on my laptop, I'm constantly receiving emails. So I think I'm going to try to see if I can incorporate that practice after this podcast. And I hope that people listening can do the same.
-hmm. Yeah, and the thing that you'll find is by taking that one day off a week, you actually become more productive when you are online. So in no way does it harm you. In every way, it helps you. Beautiful. Awesome. So is there anything else that you'd like, any other messages of truth you'd like to share before we wrap things up? Uh, no, just that uh, it's been really fantastic being on here and I love everyone out there listening and uh, sending all my yeah. all my love and, and positivity uh, to them and super, super glad that you've started this podcast. I've, I've, uh, I educate inspire change was a page that was a part of my awakening back in 2011 it was definitely one of the early pages that i ever saw on facebook and it's been a positive part of my life so when when we connected and you said you had this podcast for me i just thought oh it would be an honor to be on this podcast after nine years or so of, of knowing about this page and mm -hmm. it being a positive part of my life Thank you so much, man. It's been an honor because I think I've I've always known of you as well and I've been aware of you and uh, to finally connect with you has been an honor and a pleasure. And I think it's divine timing because the path that you're on and the path that I'm on are just meeting now, you know, and I'm hoping that our path can cross in person one day. And I hope you come to visit me in Costa Rica. Yeah, I, uh, I think you can count <laughs> on it. <laughs> awesome, brother. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. For the last year and a half, I've been working on a documentary called Pantera. It's a documentary series, and each series will follow me around a different plant medicine retreat. The first episode, Pantera, Our Plant Medicine Journey Begins, is due to be released in the coming weeks. If you would like to keep up to date with what we're doing and receive the latest updates and releases, sign your name at pantera.film. Thank you so much for listening to the Educate Inspire Change with Cash Can podcast. Your support means a lot to me. And if you would like to continue supporting me, please follow and subscribe. We're on SoundCloud, Spotify, Facebook, YouTube and iTunes. And please leave a positive review wherever you can. Thank you.